So, looking at the um, overview of Daniel here, the first section that we looked at was chapters 1 through 5, serving God in Babylon, and then serving God in Medo-Persia. So that's the first six chapters of the book. They're really historical. And I would say that when you look at those first six chapters, you're really looking at the physical in many ways. You're looking at a physical or man's viewpoint. The second part of the book is really the spiritual dimension, and that's a great picture of life, isn't it? There's what we see, the physical, and then there's the spiritual dimension, what we can't see physically, but from God's perspective, He sees it. So that's what you're getting in the second part of the book. You're going from God's message also to the outside world in the first chapters because who, who's really being addressed? Who is God speaking to often? Really, we see God revealing Himself in dreams to the kings of, of the empires of that time. So that's God proclaiming. And what did the kings say after they got the message from God? To all people. So this is God's message to all people. Even those who don't know Christ, who don't know about God and, and His coming Christ from their perspective. God's message of the gospel is going out to the world. But now He is giving a message specifically through His servant Daniel to His people. It reminds me of uh, something that Jesus said I'm going to go over to, to Mark chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but in Mark 4.10, Jesus had been speaking in parables, right? Jesus did that. We often think that parables were a way that Jesus was uh, really trying to, to, to illustrate a point so it would be really clear. Because that's what we do when we preach today a lot of times. We tell a story to make something really clear. But listen to this. When Jesus was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable, about the story. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Whoa, not expecting that. So one thing God will do is He will actually reveal things specifically to His people who have open, soft hearts that are able to receive. And to the world, it's hidden. I think this part of the book is that way. Let me give you one other scripture that speaks in this manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. What does Paul say about the natural man? Without the Spirit of God, what does he think? It's foolishness. He, he cannot receive it. Similar to what Jesus is saying. There are people that they're just not, they're not going to receive. And he spoke in parables, and it actually hid truth from them. So what we're reading in these chapters is for God's people. Most specifically, it's actually for uh, the people that God is, is working through in, in the life of Daniel, if you think about it, his chosen people Israel, right? That's a very important perspective for Daniel, the people of Israel. So we're going to see that. We're getting to the prophetic portion of Daniel. And, and as we're getting into this, this is pretty, it's interesting stuff, but it can be dangerous territory. Because does everybody see prophecy the same way? You know, to be honest with you, we don't even see, uh, as Christians, even some things that are a lot more plain than prophecy the same way, right? 
But when you get into prophecy, sometimes you really get into drastic differences. So I was telling Pastor Cook, I hope also this will probably be a Sunday school series, but later this year I want to maybe get into a series on Bible translations. So, hey, why not? Uh, just get into all the controversial things. You know, we'll do, we'll do prophecy, we'll do Bible translations, and if by that point you haven't hung me or hurt me in any way, then I guess I'm okay. <laughs> so, I want to say a few things, and again, I, I wanted to get our feet wet tonight. Uh, one thing about why there's a lot of differences is because it can be very confusing. There's a lot of information that the Bible gives, and uh, a lot of people have given different interpretations. Now, um, I actually have an example of, of one field of interpretation that actually very much correlates to, to what we teach here at church. However, I do want to make a point about this. All right, here we go. So this is the scroll that I have of a dispensational chart. All right, now I asked one time at our church, how many of you know what dispensationalism is? And surprisingly to me, pretty much everybody raised their hand. So I assume you all still know. <laughs> but the dispensationalism, all right, the, the, it breaks down history into different ways that God dealt with people is basically the idea there. So this is a chart. Now, another chart I have here, you really get to, if you, you won't be able to see this very well, but you see all of history in this chart. All the way to the end. Okay, if you could see it, you'd see that it was all of history. <laughs> but what can happen with this is we can start trying to figure out every little detail of current events. And, and in some ways, it can be humorous. So I, I happen to hear about this article. This may sound funny to some. You may think this is, this is humorous. I thought it was humorous. This is the picture that went with the article, and you notice that this teacher actually has some things crossed out <laughs> on, his, on his chart. Uh, and here was, the, uh, here was the article title, Dispensationalists Frantically Adjust End Times Chart to Include Brexit Vote. As Great Britain voted in favor of a motion to leave the European Union, premillennial dispensationalists around the world held emergency meetings Friday morning. You know, because uh, England voted to, to leave the European Union. That was not expected uh, by uh, end times uh, people. <laughs> so they're uh, frantically adjusting their prophetic charts to include the completely unanticipated new development we're thinking of calling this one the Brexit dispensation, Tim LaHaye told reporters, as he hastily altered his precise wall charts to account for the new information. We had previously thought that Saddam Hussein would be the one to usher in the one world government, but that's looking less likely now. So we're going to make some official adjustments, LaHaye added, that the European Union, the European Union might not be ushering in an age of one world government after all unfortunately. So, if I happen to give some interpretations that don't line up with the Left Behind series, please don't be mad at me. <laughs> and let me also say, Tim LaHaye, I have high respect for him, actually. And what he was trying to do in the Left Behind series with Jerry Jenkins was to take what the Bible says and try to show people how it could look today. But the danger with that is we start to think that those things are explicitly said in the Bible, every little detail, and it's not. And I want you to realize that there's a lot of information we have that you may not even realize where you got it from the Bible and where you got it from just someone who's teaching it. So I'll give you a, a good example of this. When we talk about the, the tribulation, a lot of times we think that it is, a, it is, we hear that it's seven years, so we think it's a given that when you read the book of Revelation, you're going to find that specifically stated that way. Actually, the book of Revelation doesn't talk about a seven-year tribulation explicitly. 
Where do we get that seven-year tribulation from? The book of Daniel. Not Revelation. It has to do with a prophecy we're going to get to in chapter 9. But don't look there yet because we're not there. So here's a point I want to make that there are actually different approaches to how people see prophecy. Uh, looking at the book of Revelation, I apologize, I know a lot of these charts are hard to see. Um, but this is looking at the book of Revelation from what's called an idealist school. The idealist school is basically looking at Revelation as if it was just uh, symbolic of, of world history. That it's not talking about the future, it's just talking about world history and the battle between good and evil. And so if you look at this, there's the patristic, the medieval, the reformation, the modern churches. It's all encompassed in the whole book of Revelation, including the millennial. The millennium is looked at as something happening already, and therefore, we often will call this kind of a view amillennialism. In other words, there's no actual literal millennium where Jesus reigns on earth. But you're probably more familiar with the views that are futurist. Now, this is historic premillennialism. If I'm confusing you, welcome to the world of prophecy. Histor <laughs> historic premillennialism. Notice, if, if you can see it, that the tribulation is there. And then, right after the tribulation, you have the second coming, and the believers are raised, and Armageddon takes place, and then the millennium. What do most of us have been taught? This one right here. What happens? Before the tribulation, what do you see there? If you can see it, it's the rapture. And then the tribulation, and then the second coming, and then Christ reigns. Okay. So all that to show you that people take a lot of data and they organize it in different ways. So here are some principles of interpretation. We want to be consistent. We want to try to interpret Scripture straightforwardly. And that's why I showed you those different approaches. In my opinion, the last two approaches are much more straightforward. <laughs> They're trying to take the Bible at face value. And so when we look at some prophecy, instead of trying to read history into it, sometimes we have to be honest and say, I don't think this has ever happened. So it's still to come. And you're going to see that's very important as we look at, at some of these prophecies in Daniel. So be consistent as much as possible. Another way we can be consistent, by the way, is to look at what happened in the past with prophecy. When past prophecy was fulfilled, a good example is Jesus. He fulfilled prophecy, right? Now, when Jesus fulfilled prophecy... We learn a lot from that because he fulfilled it literally, but not all at once. Ooh. So now you, you start to see how, wow, this can really be a lot to put together. He came just the way the Scripture said. So I, I believe in literal fulfillment. That's my position that I take. But I don't believe it all happens at once. Sometimes when prophets look at things, they see, it's, it's like looking at mountaintops, and they see the mountaintops, but there's a lot in between that still has to take place. And so what you get in the, the biblical picture is like all the views of the mountaintops, but you don't always know the distance between them and how it all fits together until hindsight. But we still do have a view of the, of the future, I believe. So be consistent. Number two, let Scripture interpret Scripture. It's amazing how much you can understand if you actually just read it. Profound, isn't it? But, but honestly, so many people, it's amazing how interpreters, it's like they just saw one verse and then forgot to read the rest. It actually interprets itself a lot. So just listen to what it says. Even in this chapter, we're going to see that where, you know, you might say, oh, these, these different beasts that he's seeing, what is it? He tells you. So maybe go by that. 
All right, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Number three, look at God's general revelation. Is, Is God the God of all that we see? And that includes the past events as well as the present events. Now, I, I kind of made light of some of the ways we can get too much into current events. And I really believe that's true. Um, we need to hold lightly to things that the Bible is not explicit about. And you have all heard and seen, I'm sure, people that have talked about um, we just know that Jesus is going to come back this year, right? People have said that. We don't know when he's coming back. The Bible tells us we don't know exactly when he's coming back, but to be ready for him to come back, right? That, that's, that's what we do know. It reminds me of that cartoon. Maybe you saw it where, you know, this guy had the sign, and he said the end of the world is coming on some date. And another prophet was next to him and he was an older person and he looked at him and said you're an amateur and his sign said the end of the world is near no date okay so it's a lot wiser to not give a date (laughs) but but we can get way too much into current events and think we know every single detail is the point i'm making hold lightly to that but on the other hand When you look at Daniel, for example, these things, we'll look a little little bit here, you will see, wow, these things line up with events. And some events are unmistakable. I mean, has anyone noticed Israel's back? That's pretty important, right? (laughs) So there are events we should be looking at that definitely play into what God is doing in, in the unfolding of his plan. One other be humble and open-minded about, especially about future prophecy. So as I said, don't be mad at me if what I say doesn't line up with maybe something you've read or heard. Um, we, need to be, we need to be humble about this. Remember, when Jesus came, there were aspects of his coming people just were not expecting. If they had been careful and humble, they would have seen it. So, the prophecy we're going to look at, uh, I didn't put these slides in the exact order I wanted. Let me get to the one I want. There we go. The prophecies that we're going to look at, I'm just going to give you an overview of them. Daniel's chapter 7 through 12 gives four different prophecies. The first one is a big picture. We can think about this in such a unique way today because we have, uh, we have images of the earth, right? And if you think about Google Maps, I don't know how many of you have seen something like that where you can see the whole earth now. You can see the big picture. That's what we get with this vision here. It's four earthly kingdoms and God's kingdom. That's chapter 7. But then what can you do with the Google Maps? You can zoom in to a specific point. And so we're now in this next chapter, chapter 8, He's going to look from Medo-Persia to Greece. And then uh, chapter 9, from the end of the exile to Christ. That's chapter 9. From the end of Israel's exile to the time of the coming of Christ. And then a big picture again, Darius, Medo-Persian time period to the end of the age. Now, because of what we're just about to look at, you're going to actually see that this can be broken down into uh, three different portions in a different way than I've been breaking it down. Some people have broken it down that the first chapter of Daniel is an introduction. This, this chapters 2 through 7 is the times of the Gentiles, which, by the way, Jesus refers to. He says there's a time period where the Gentiles rule. And then finally... Israel's destiny is the last chapters. Now, one one reason we can break it up that way is a reason you can't see when you read your Bible. It's because of the languages that are used. Because Daniel uses two different languages. The first chapter in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7 in the language of the world of the time, Aramaic. 
and then back to Hebrew again in chapters 8 through 12. And you'll see even the prophecies of 8 through 12 deal a lot with Israel. So that's another way of breaking this down. So we're going to now look at the beginning of a prophecy here tonight. And uh, to put it in context, I know, again, you can't necessarily see this very well, but this is in 553 B.C., which is the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So Daniel's vision here, I know if you've been going through Daniel with us, you kind of, all right, Cyrus came, and we've got, you know, Darius and Cyrus, and now the medo Persian. but we actually have to go back now. Daniel got this vision, and this is very important to consider. Daniel got this vision while Babylon was still in charge. So he actually experienced the vision we're going to read in chapter 7 while Belshazzar was king of Babylon. He was the one actually uh, co-regent ruling in Babylon while Nabonidus was away. Okay, so chapter 7, let's, let's read the first several verses here. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, second, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, a dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom the three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Wow. Ever have a dream like that? This is God revealing truth to Daniel. And it's apocalyptic. A lot of symbols here, isn't, aren't there? So as I said, this takes place in 553 B.C. This is between the time of Nebuchadnezzar's madness in chapter 4 and the time of the fall of Babylon in chapter 5. So I want to if I get the slide up here, show you those four beasts as one person engraved this. And this was from the year 1630. So I, I hope you can see this okay. This is one depiction of those four beasts and Daniel who's having this vision while on his bed. Very interesting as you look at this. The number four, four beasts. And you're going to see later Clearly, he says in the chap later in the chapter, it refers to four kings, four kingdoms. But that should actually ring a bell because there's already been something in the book of Daniel very similar to this. Look at these four kingdoms, right? The first four right there, Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, Grecian Empire, Roman Empire. What is the statue? What is this... Uh, what is this referring to? This is, this is at the beginning of the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He envisions 
empires. And remember, Daniel gave the interpretation. He said, this is what these represent. You're the head of gold. There's going to come another nation and another after and another after. So Daniel has already talked about this in his book. But now we're getting God's perspective. All right? Now we're seeing things as God reveals them to Daniel. And so we have here actually those four empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Those are the four beasts. Now, some more critical liberal scholars from what I have read have actually thought that uh, Daniel is wrong. They believe all kinds of things. Again, to the natural man, these things are foolishness. And they don't think Daniel could possibly be as accurate as he is actually for telling all these things. And so they think that the second, uh, the second beast is referring to the Medes and the third referring to the Persians. However, if you read, again, just read Daniel in chapter 5, verse 28, for example, it says to Belshazzar, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and then later the Persians. No, the Medes and the Persians. And later, when they're talking about the laws, remember when Daniel is thrown into the, to the lion's den? What are the laws of? The Medes and Persians. In other words, Daniel knew that that was one empire and put it together. And it, he lived during that, so of course he knew. The liberal scholars don't accept that. Why? Because the book of Daniel is so accurate when it gets to prophecy. They have a very hard time. And so they, they, they look at it very differently. So I'm going to quickly read a note that I, because uh, we're going to finish up real soon here for tonight, but just to summarize some of the uh, ideas that you see in these, with these four beasts here. So just, you can keep looking up there as I read this. From the NIV Study Bible, did a good, I, good job summarizing uh, what a lot, lot of interpreters feel about these beasts and the images. The lion with an eagle's wings is a cherub symbolizing the Neo the Neo Babylonian Empire, which, by the way, th that was one of their symbols was a lion with wings. The rest of verse four, where it talks about that beast receiving a heart, perhaps reflects the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar, as recorded in chapter four. So that might actually be pointing to Nebuchadnezzar receiving understanding from God. And one person that uh, I was listening to was talking about that's actually uh, uh, really possibly pointing to his salvation experience. Then in verse 5, the bear raised up on one of its sides refers to the superior status of the Persians and the Medo-Persian alliance. So the, it's the empire of the Medes and Persians, but the Persian part is more dominant the three ribs in its mouth represent the three principal conquests, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Those are all in the five, year 500 BC, five, the 500s BC. So those three ribs could refer to the nations that are being conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire. Then the leopard with its four wings, verse 6, represents the speedy... You think of a leopard, they're pretty fast, right? That represents Greece, right? Alexander the Great in the 300s. How did his empire take over? Very slowly? No, very quickly. Macedon and Greece. Um, oh, excuse me, I, I skipped ahead there. So the four heads of that beast, the leopard with the four heads. I wouldn't want to see a leopard with one head, but I definitely wouldn't want to see a leopard with four heads. The leopard with four heads corresponds to the four main divisions into which his empire fell when he died in 323. Macedon and Greece, Thrace and Asia Minor, Syria and, uh, and the Holy Land and Egypt. So those are the, the four divisions. And then the fourth beast, verse 7, with its terrible power surpassing all its predecessors points to the Roman Empire. Now, I read that quickly to show you that interpreters will, will sometimes actually try to get into the details of what these things could mean. And I thought they did a good job summarizing. To be honest with you, if you, if you get into commentaries, <laughs> you'll get lots of interpretations, <laughs> all right? 
but I didn't want to uh, get way too much into that. I really want to, to give, I think what can happen is if we get too much into the details, we sometimes miss the main point. But I wanted to give you some details to see how cool that is. Because it is neat how it really li- these beasts really do line up with history. Now that horn, that little horn, it talks about in the notes here referring to Antichrist or world power sharing in the characteristics of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, that rings a bell for those of us who have studied the end times before, and we will talk about that more. Here's a really important point that I want to make in closing. This is from Wal- uh, a commentator, uh, Walverd, who says, Chapter 2, that statue there, considers world's history from man's viewpoint. Remember what I said about the first chapters of Daniel? That's man's viewpoint. And what does that look like from man's viewpoint? Wow. It's glorious and imposing. Chapter 7 views world history from God's standpoint. How does he see those nations? Pretty ugly. (laughs) All right? And so from God's standpoint, he sees the nations in its immorality, their brutality, and their depravity. What a good point. Two different perspectives of the same thing. So when we look at the world around us, it's easy to see things from, from a human perspective and to be in awe of what humans are doing. But you know, God sees things very differently, and sometimes what can look impressive is actually very much against God. A good example of this is the Tower of Babel, right? Everybody was coming together for this this place of worship and building this tower, what did God think of it? See, being unified isn't necessarily good if you're unified around the wrong thing, especially false worship. In God's sight, that's depraved. It's ugly. On the other hand, there are things that the world disdains and looks at as bad. Even the church, how does God see it? It's beautiful. It's good. And ultimately, we see that in the centerpiece of history on the cross of Christ. That was an ugly thing. From a human standpoint, what happened on the cross. But from God's standpoint, he had a different perspective. It was through Jesus on the cross, he was saving the world. Saving us from our sin. So let's, as we look at this, remember God's viewpoint is unique And he shares it with us if we study his word. Let's pray. I I ask.